Good morning, everyone. I think we'll start right now. <coughs> uh, hi, uh, I'm Rabimba Koranjai. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about something I termed as security pie, which essentially is like a big hack of a lot of scripts cobbled together, a lot of open source software cobbled together in your Raspberry Pi, which can run and hopefully give your Raspberry Pi a little more insight if it is getting attacked or not, and if your IoT device is getting attacked or not. So with that, a little bit of introduction. Uh, I am uh, I'm Rabimba Koronjai. Uh, right now, um, I'm a student at Rice University, and I also contribute to, I used to contribute to Mozilla's uh, Emerging Technology Division, and I work a little bit on VR and other stuff. This work mostly started as a hobby project and with some push from Mozilla about a certain project which is not there anymore. And uh, so this is completely different to what I do in my school. So first, why? Whenever you go to home, what are the devices you see? These are the little, some of the things I, I don't see in my room, but in a lot of people's room. You see a smart TV. I see a Nest. Uh, you have little bots which you can control from your mobile, and it just runs around. You, of course, have your mobile, which is um, essentially a mini computer, always connected. And of course, you have other intelligent devices like a Bluetooth connected to toothbrush. And now it can even actually upload your data. So great, these are all connected devices. Yeah. These are now computers? Um, yeah, but I'm assuming the computer is a little bit more secure from the operating system perspective. So I'm mostly going to concentrate on the devices which I'm assuming is not. But the solution applies. Now, let us see. What is, like, how are they all getting connected in your home? All these devices, how are they, they getting connected to the network, to the internet? Most of them don't have any inbuilt connection to the internet, so they rely on Wi-Fi, your home Wi-Fi, to connect to the internet. So we have a single point of contact, which is probably my Wi-Fi router, and if I can probably protect that, maybe I can protect these. It's the same with IoT devices, your do-it-yourself IoT devices and other things, we can do that. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you have tried to do, in some point of time, uh, like a do-it-yourself project with a Raspberry Pi or maybe a BeagleBone Black? Quite a lot. And how many of you just wanted to get the feel of the product? That, OK, uh, I'm going to try the new Raspberry Pi 3 or maybe the Intel Edison. Uh, I'm going to install something and just turn these lights on and off. Maybe build a, like, uh, kind of uh, like coffee on off machine or something like that. So when you do that, you quickly code, put something, it works, and you are excited, yeah, it works. I have a dashboard, I built a dashboard. How many of you actually think that, okay, these are getting connected, so do you do anything to protect them? Like installing firewall? I see one person, two, three. Okay, that's even like quite a lot. I myself didn't use to. So, because, uh, okay, it works, it works. And uh, when I was actually doing, like making something for a demo, and I realized the new Raspbian, if you do an apt update even, it doesn't connect to HTTPS sources. It's connect to HTTP sources for repo. Now, we need to protect these devices, these hardwares, which are mostly unpatched, unprotected, because they are hard to upgrade. Some of you were here for the previous talk. You know how hard it is to upgrade uh, like embedded devices. So we need other ways. So we need to protect the legacy devices. Wait, do we need protection? So this is a graph I just pulled out from an article from Symantec. And they were trying to see how attacks on IoT devices increased or decreased over the time. And this was published like uh, beginning of 2006, I think. So as you can see, it sharply increased in 2015, and 
they predict it will keep on doing like that. So yeah, we probably need some amount of protection. And another case is that the recent DDoS attacks, a lot of them are now in the way of using our household devices. Maybe your refrigerator is taking part in a botnet. Maybe your Raspberry Pi, which you put there to just sense the temperature. Now it's part of a big botnet bringing down things like GitHub or things. Now, we need to protect it somehow, and we need, don't need to break a bank for that. So my tools for the trade is uh, a Raspberry Pi 3 with a case to protect itself, and I need a micro SD card for noobs, and uh, I need a power adapter, which is very important in this case. So why Raspberry Pi? Uh, when I asked how many of you Raspberry Pi, uh, used Raspberry Pis, a lot of hands went up. Matter of fact, they sold more than 10 million, uh, yeah, 10 million devices until uh, 2016, end, September, which is quite a lot. And these are like cute little small $35 literal computers which you can carry around or put it in your project. They are capable of running everything a computer does, but like you pointed out, I did not put computer in my talk because they are not as protected as a computer. So to do that and to protect our other devices, let me start. So I'm going to install a noobs, uh, like an image on that, mostly the Raspbian, and we'll start doing something with it. So the end goal of this talk is that we'll have a device which, if you plug in your network, it will try to protect your other devices which are connected to the network and which are not upgradable or patchable. How to do that? So what about my network? What do I know about my network? Uh, mostly nothing, apart from the fact that there are packets getting flown around all the time. So all the packets belongs to us. Now, we need to configure the network. Now, there are three ways, as I found out, which I can do. So first is that I am defining a gateway in my Raspberry Pi. And I connect to that gateway, and all my traffic flows through that, which is not at all a good solution, because somebody trying to do something nefarious, or I'm assuming your device has already got hacked, and they can just bypass it by changing the gateway settings. The option two I found out, which was pretty elegant, is that some routers, some hardware support mirror port, where you can actually have a port which takes all your traffic and sends it to your computer or Raspberry Pi. The problem with this approach is that this is pretty device specific and most of the devices I found supports it are not exactly household devices. So they are like pretty big switches and costly devices. So not a good fit for a grad student. So the grad student way, put your Raspberry Pi in between your router and the internet and I get all the traffics. So the problem with this approach is the, there are performance implications. My Raspberry Pi might not be able to handle all the traffic, and it might hinder my Netflix streaming, but let's try. So what are the things I'm gonna do? First, I'm gonna try to sniff the packets. I'm gonna try a deep packet inspection for my packets. Now, not exactly deep packet. So I'm gonna go over with a tool called Bro, which is, uh, IDS, so it, what it essentially does is that it gets into your device, it can capture all your traffic, so it can also take a pickup file, but it can also live capture your traffic, and it does a lot of things on that. Now, getting Bro into Raspberry Pi was a little challenging, because it has a lot of dependencies, but there are a lot of great articles out there, so I quickly found out how to do that. And so we install Raspberry Pi, uh, so Bro in the Raspberry Pi, and all of these, which I'm gonna show now and few, uh, in other slides, they're all cobbled together in a script, which I'm gonna show later, the link to. So don't worry about all the codes. These slides look too dry. Now, once we have Bro, what happens is that this is my packet. This is the captured packet with the Bro. I have 
something like this. So Bro actually takes your traffic and passes it and does a lot of things like connection log, DHCP log, DNS log, and all of these has different indicators. We can actually act with these indicators, but I want to make it more intelligent. How can we make it more intelligent? We need a huge list of data to do that, or maybe a labeled data where I know which is attack, which is not, or which are bad actors, which are not. How do I do that? I want to do fingerprint analysis, like CSI does. Now, to do that and to make Bro great again, I'm going to integrate Critical Stack. So Critical Stack, uh, I think, recently got again acquired by Capital One. But this was an Intel company. And once you go there, they have a lot of different sources of data. For example, if you see, I have phishing domains, I have fault domains, and there are a lot of things. So I, if I get these data, then I have a way of knowing which are actually known phishing domains, which are, if, if something is running from my Raspberry Pi and sending those links, I know there is something wrong. So this gives me a plethora of data. Now, installing it in Raspberry Pi is fairly simple. You have an ARM distribution for it, you install it, and you're good to go. Now, you need an API key to access it. And uh, so the API key is actually free. I even tried last night that to see if it really is still free, and it's still free. And these are all code snippets from the GitHub where it's hosted, which I'm going to show later. Now, once I have this, I also need a way to actually audit my device. I'm assuming my device got hacked. Even my Raspberry Pi got hacked somehow. So, I can never ensure that it won't be attacked or it won't be hacked. I can never ensure that. But what I can do is that to have a way to audit it so that I know how it happened. So I need a way to log it all and to see. So what about my logs? I'm going to stash the log in Logstash. So how many of you have worked with uh, Logstash or Elasticsearch before? OK. So I'm going to use three devices, which are commonly called ELK. So Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. And all three of them together will give me the system which I'm going to show today. So what Logstash does is that it takes the data source, it takes as input plugin, it filters the plugin, and outputs the plugin, and you get the logged data. So this data, you can have different filters which you can put by coding yourself and have different uh, notifications on that. For example, I can make my Raspberry Pi to actually inform me, to notify me, in case something bad happens. So this notification part, Logstash will do. So in short, what it does is that you can take different type of in inputs, which you can see some of them here, then we have a different type of filters like grok, search and place, a lot of things. Some of these I used are grok and uh, GOIP filters and some other. And then the output can go to a different type of things. For example, in a database maybe, or maybe a visualization tool, or somewhere you can actually see and analyze the data. For our case, I used Elasticsearch because that was easier and pretty. So what we will do? We'll utilize some custom patterns to actually see what is going on. And we'll use Grok messaging patterns. We'll add some custom fields, use GeoIP. There's a very specific reason for that. I'll show a later slide. We'll use the date match and translation of threat intel. So in short, what it will do is that if somebody from a different country is connecting to your device or your device is sending data simultaneously to a lot of weird countries, it will show a flag. OK, no, what is going on? If I have different message formats, or if I have a package inside, which is downloading maybe the frack, all the magazines, and then it will show me that, OK, no, like this is something weird going on. So getting log stash. So the log stash, uh, so to put log stash in, uh, Raspberry Pi is a little problematic. So 
There is a simple way of getting uh, it downloading and trying to install it, which probably won't work because it needs some other, div uh, other installation files to do it. Once we have all of that, how do I see the logs? All the logs we have will eventually go to Elasticsearch. So to get Elasticsearch, I just install the Elastic, I just download the div file and install it. Once you install it, you will have to update the cluster file name in the YML file. This you will have to do manually because my script doesn't do that. Now, this is all fancy, but I want you actually want to see. When I want to see, I mean visually see what is happening. So I need Kibana. Kibana is kind of like a visual dashboard where you, have, you can have a way of showing all this data and digging deep into it. So this is how we install Kibana. But if you try all this, this is like an official method, and then you get an error because it needs something in ARM, which is a node version. So we install the node, of, node version of ARM, and then Kibana works. This all, by the way, takes a lot of time and trial and error to essentially get done, hence the script and this talk today. So once we have Kibana, we can actually configure an index pattern of how this all will work. So now comes the hard part. So once we have the configuration file, you see where the position it starts and where the Elasticsearch node goes. So, and we have an option to provide the cluster file name, which is Elasticsearch for many case. Now, we can provide different filters. This is a simple got filter I have put. What it does is that it tries to take my whole message in a string format. It tries to differentiate based on my IP, which will be my client, based on different words, what will be my method, and the URL where it is getting connected. Once we have that, we save all these patterns in a file. So, once we save this pattern in a file, they will be saved in a different messages, and we actually label these messages. So this number is my label. Why do I need the labeling and the fields? So once I actually uh, have all these parsed data and I add labels and fields on it, next time when something bad is happening and Kibana has to search between all, like if it is already in the database or not, it doesn't have to do the computation extensive uh, operation of regular expression in the whole message. Instead, it will just search for those specific tags to see if those numbers, so these numbers like 291009, which makes it much easier. Now, what will I have with my GeoIP data? So if I want to put more GeoIP data than what I have, then I define a specific field here and put my GeoIP file, if I have something from my honeypot or somewhere else, which essentially I have. Now, we are gonna also see that what happens if my device tries to connect to those bad IPs, which I already have defined. And once it does, by bad IP, I'm also assuming that I will have information from different sources. For example, the IPs, which are Tor exit nodes maybe, so if I can put all the Tor exit nodes inside, and once I go through, if my device is connecting to any Tor node and I don't use Tor in that case, it will show me a notification that, okay, something is wrong. So this is mostly how it gets done. If it gets something like this, then bad IP, something like that, very bad IP, just normal search. So these are the two sources where I get my IPs. So Tor exit IP I get from here, and my bad IP source, which I get from here, which we'll have to import to the Kibana database. Now, what do I know? I just told you we import a lot of files, we download a lot of files from a lot of websites, put it in our database. We still don't actually see what is going on in our device. We don't have insight. So to get the insight, this is a simple email we're gonna get. So I'm assuming I have a SMTP server which we have to protect. And so if the search matches and you have a device which connects to a torn exit node, 
then you get a mail that somebody is connecting to Tor from your devices or any of your household devices. And you, I, am I using Tor? I'm not, then what is going on? Now, these are the different type of alerts this script is right now able to handle. Uh, the Tor IP and malicious IP list you can update with if you have more, and if you don't have, you can use the existing list and it will go on. Uh, the thing is that there is no learning part involved in it. The system does not learn yet. Now, if I see in Kibana, so this is something we get. Uh, this is the imported data, and uh, you see that uh, the attacks, the different IPs from different regions, how it all works out. And the awesome thing about Kibana is you actually can drill down into the data. So you actually can see what is going on from which country, how many, and everything like that. So I very much like this database, but it doesn't do us much good. Now, all of these I told, assuming I already got attacked and hacked even. So all of these are like, okay, this already happened, and I'm trying to prevent that of doing more damage. But what about proactivity? So here we have InMap, which will try to schedule a scan of the subnet. So if somebody is scanning, and if you have a new device connected or anything, it will parse it and put it in a file, which we can see that, okay, these devices, these are normal devices which gets connected. These are new devices which got connected. Now, oh, okay, so all these wrapped up in a nice script is here, which you can download, and if you just initiate the initial installation script, it will download and install all for you. Something I missed out on my slide is there is also uh, another portion of code you will see there, which mostly dis uh, deals with network discovery. So we try to actually see which devices are getting connected or disconnected to my device. Now, learn more. This is not part of that code, this is a different code. But I thought, okay, if I am getting this much amount of data, why not try to do something more? Machine learning is all rage nowadays. So I tried to do something similar. So this is specifically for a device which was kept open with just SSH uh, open to the public. And by open, I mean not anonymous login is allowed. No, it's not. It has username and password uh, entry, and it logs every access attempt normally, what it does. So I wrote a simple parser which uh, uh, um, tries to parse all the logs I get and see what is going on, and put all the insights I had from different GeoIP. So as you can see, same, same user, which I had a demo, demo user setup, I had a few demo user setup, who logged in at the same time from very two different geolocations, which was, okay, that's weird. Now, on the right side, if you see, that's a graph that's showing how many users try to log in. So since this is a honeypot, they can log in, they can try to do different stuff, which we'll see they are succeeding. After some point, they'll just get, like, they'll, they'll get disconnected and it will go into the block list. So next time, they won't get connected at least from the same IP. So these are the different uh, login times I got from in a different time span. And the most interesting thing is this. So the X and Y axis denotes that how much time a user was logged in. So these are all attacked users because I never gave actually the password to anyone or the accounts. So these devices actually got compromised. And this is the most interesting part, which is this user got, this user was logged in for a negative time. So I actually got a SSH uh, login who was logged in for a negative time period, which was awesome, interesting. I don't have an explanation other than the fact he changed geolocation, time zone, whatever, or my system just failed. So does it work? So this is something else I got. So the left chart is from the same semantic article I got uh, from this morning. Uh, which uh, this they tried in their own honeypot of Symantec. And these are the different countries which actually attacked and uh, are attacking mostly the Symantec honeypots. And on the right side, these are my two Raspberry Pis which got uh, kind of 
owned. Now, if you see the country list, they don't exactly match, but they match pretty good enough. So, this is just a trend that what Symantec with their very big infrastructure is noticing actually happens, actually can happen to us as well. Another lesson to not only use SSH with username and password. So this is where the remaining part of the code resides, where you can get the code for uh, the parser and getting how you can actually cluster them. So this actually has a lot of more things going on. For example, we do a lot of, uh, try to do a lot of k-means clustering to cluster different activities and stuff, which I'm not covering in the talk. So this is where the code resides. Now, is there a commercial solution available? There is actually. So Asus and Chain Micro actually collaborated and made these awesome devices, which kind of does the similar work. And say they, they cost like around 140 to $350. They called it the AI protection. So artificial intelligence is now protecting us. What it does is that it's exactly same. It sits in, your device, uh, in your home. It acts as a barrier between your device and un, uh, internet. And the most awesome claim it does is that it tells you that it can patch on the fly your devices uh, without uh, actually patching them. So it can do on the fly patching. So that was like, I was mind blown. What is happening? How can somebody like do on the fly patching? What essentially turns out is that they do deep packet inspection and do something very similar to what we do with uh, initially with critical stack. They have their own like vulnerabilities. What happens with the existing device? Once your device gets connected to these routers, they get registered that, okay, this device is connecting and this device is connecting. When you're, all your data goes in, they do a deep packet inspection. If they can find a similar type of attack, they just block it. So that's what their auto patching does. But uh, since I realized this is too costly for me, so I was checking with my Raspberry Pi, which is $35. The total solution probably will come around 50, 60 maybe. So that was mostly all I had for today. And thank you, everybody. I'm open for any questions you might have. Yeah, so the question was, instead of uh, trying to use a shell to actually download everything, can't we use Ansible or something like that, which essentially makes it much easier and life much easier to like, maintain it later? So the problem with that is that uh, Raspberry Pi has a limited capacity, so I didn't want to install anything more than I needed to to uh, like make it work. So th that is the same logic uh, for installing Bro instead of Snort. I actually tried to use Snort for the same purpose, which got installed nicely. Then the device literally crawled. So I could not do anything in the Raspberry Pi at all after that. So that was one of the reason. And I have not tried it with Ansible in Raspberry Pi. I'm pretty sure uh, if it can handle it, it will work just fine. So this is, was just like a kind of concept that what you can do. I'm sure mo all of you can like write much better, easier script to do all these in one go. But I try to do that in shell script. Yeah. Uh, which one? So there are two. I did. So I actually, uh, so something I have left out is that after doing all this, I tried to do uh, like install, which actually scans my environment. So open VAS, things like that. 
Uh, so with just uh, bro ELK installed, the Raspberry Pi works pretty fine. I can watch Netflix. I have tried watching Netflix in 4K, so packet goes fine. And uh, you can even log into that. You can do single stuff. Like, it works. Uh, so the load is around uh, more than 50%. I didn't need a uh, like cooler or anything. But with uh, OpenVAS installed, uh, it still works, but it takes a lot of time. I mean, uh, it pretty much if you, inst like, uh, next time you go inside it, you try to do any different stuff, it kind of crawls. You will get very like big lags and things like that. So till now, it's OK. And Raspberry Pi 3, I have not tried in 2, so no idea. <laughs> I have not tried with OpenWRT and DDWRT. I just got my hands on in one for in my lab uh, for a different purpose. Maybe I'll try it uh, later on. I did try it with uh, similar things, for example, Intel Edison. But then again, Edison costs like almost $100, and which essentially brings it much, makes it much less desirable. But it works much faster. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's what I did. So I just passed it through. So that's why I said in line. So uh, the elegant solution would have been. Uh, the yeah. So my limiting or my assumptions are that uh, the bad actors won't have physical access to my router or anywhere near that. So they will only have access to the Wi-Fi. So that once they connect to it. I can monitor the remaining part. Same will be applicable for any IoT devices that they don't have physical access to your network endpoint or anywhere where they can like bypass any monitoring. Yep. Yeah, it's just for the Raspberry Pi. I have had instances where it uh, just randomly stopped or restarted with my mobile charger. So that is one essential piece I learned that you save a lot of debugging time if you have a proper 2.5 uh, volt like charger. Uh, there are a lot of other threats. So uh, I mean, uh, I just looked into a very specific set of it. Uh, for example, there are two files in the repo where you can uh, like put uh, what other things to look for. And for me, I just looked at IP, GeoIP, time, and things like that. I wanted to do a time series kind of thing. But uh, there are a lot of other aspects. For example, in this one, uh, when we are extracting features, you can think of a lot of different things to actually uh, incorporate as your feature and not extraction. Just think of it that in critical stack, when you are getting a lot of indicators, you can mix and match them with different properties, and you have your like, okay, this is bad or this is good for me. Yeah. How many devices were you testing? Uh, uh, where I was testing this with? So uh, I was testing this with uh, in my home, which had essentially I had almost. Around 11, 12, I think. 11, 12 Wi Fi devices. That was another eye opener for me how many, even we don't have a lot of things, how many Wi Fi devices we actually connect every day. Uh, I have tried that 
which essentially got me locked down, locked out of the system. So there, so in the code, you will find uh, instances where it uh, uses fail to ban, just like uh, not users actually, just to use their data, like block list or even IP tables will work that put them inside that, and uh, which is not a very good way of doing it because. Uh, Getting notification is okay, but if that was real traffic or something really was going on, uh, you are doing something on a laptop and it automatically blocks you. So that might not be a very good scenario. But if you have a like, pretty good confident uh, things that a confident score of like, okay, these are not good. So anything like this happens, block it. So you can do that. So essentially just IP tables or block list. Um, integration part, I mean, there are very bad, I mean, in the code, there is a way to integrate it. It's a very bad way. I won't recommend it since I got locked out. And uh, uh, yeah, there probably is a better way, but there is a way in the code to, actually, I just changed their, uh, so when you actually use fail to ban, it actually maintains uh, two lists, like which are good and which are bad. And you can just mimic the same behavior. If I think that, okay, these, these, these IPs are doing this kind of thing, I just send it like, okay, uh, these tried five times, which is their indicator of putting it in block list. And it will just block that IP, that specific instance. Any more questions? No, no, it does not have SSL strip. So also, uh, if you have SSL certificate, certificate pinning, none of these will actually work that much. Yes, you can. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>